Okay, so um, let's get started. Um, today's topic is um, obviously meta-analysis. Um, so I want to uh, first uh, go over just sort of what meta-analysis is and some of the important points about it. Um, and then um, I have three uh, examples, three meta-analyses that I'm gonna go over just to illustrate uh, a lot of the concepts and some of the uh, issues related to uh, meta-analysis and then um, just summarize um, a little bit. Uh, and so uh, one of the um, things about meta-analysis is that there was a time when it was regarded as sort of the pinnacle of uh, the quality of information. And so it, this little diagram appeared. And so from the bottom um, going up, uh, I think it's pretty good in terms of the quality of information. Some case series, case control studies, the cohort studies, and then um, what's considered the gold standard of research is randomized controlled trials. However, um, here meta-analysis or a systematic review and then a meta-analysis at the top. So what I hope to do is show you um, or to illustrate that that's probably not the case or if you do a meta-analysis or you're reading meta-analysis or using it for some reason to um, basically be pretty skeptical of, of a meta-analysis. So uh, meta-analysis combines published uh, studies, the results from published studies. Um, and essentially it um, was meant to overcome sample size issues and then also to estimate a true effect size of some treatment or therapy. Um, and the key here is for a meta-analysis is from summary data. So you don't actually have access to the uh, to the raw data, but just to what's been published. A patient level meta-analysis though, uh, which you sometimes see is um, a meta-analysis that combines data from several studies, the actual data. Now this is, you probably don't see this too much because there's some issues in getting data from different studies. One thing, um, if it's across institutions then some institutions may not be willing to share their data with you, or it's, uh, it usually involves getting some sort of uh, legal uh, permission to use other people's data. So we're, we're going to focus on um, a meta-analysis where we uh, are using summary, summary data. And so the first step in a meta-analysis is uh, what's called data abstraction. And so this is essentially a systematic review, uh, and I've kind of underlined every article that deals with the topic of interest. Uh, every article probably isn't going to be uh, realistic uh, for a number of reasons, but you want to try and get as many uh, articles, published articles that deal with the uh, topic that you're interested in. And you essentially do this by giving your library and a set of keywords and doing a, a literature search. And so then once you have that list uh, of publications and you need at least two independent abstractors, uh, in other words, uh, just because it shows up in the literature search doesn't mean that the article is ap applicable to your particular uh, research question or uh, what you, what you want to uh, investigate. So you have to go through um, all of the articles that you have. Um, and <clears throat> as I mentioned, you need at least two um, individuals doing this independently. This is obviously the most uh, important and the most time consuming part of doing a meta-analysis. Uh, once we get it all in hand, then doing the statistics is actually quite easy. Um, so most of the time that you spend on doing the meta-analysis is going to be spent with 
finding uh, the articles um, that uh, apply and have the data that you need. So uh, a concept uh, that we need to um, think about in terms of meta-analysis and also some other areas that we'll maybe talk about in the future, but um, that's the idea of fixed and random effects. And what we mean by a fixed effect is that you have a finite set of levels of a factor or variable that are of specific interest. And the main one in meta-analysis is usually treatment or therapy you want to compare uh, treatment A with treatment B or um, a particular drug with a placebo. Um, there you know, can be others, but, the, but in meta-analysis, that's probably what you're doing the meta-analysis for, or the reason that you're doing the meta-analysis is to uh, compare uh, treatments. Random effects are effects that... Uh, are attributable to uh, an infant and, or a large set of levels of a factor. And so in this case, you typically can only get a random, um, more or less, a sample um, of these effects. And so for example, uh, clinical trial sites would be a random effect because you can't possibly get every um, trial site uh, involved. Uh, geographic regions would be another one uh, of a random effect. Um, however, patients or subjects are always a random effect, um, whether you're doing meta-analysis or any other kind of statistical analysis. So random. the reason that uh, random effects are important to consider is that uh, if you have a a particular cluster in your design, then the data from those clusters might be correlated. In other words, they're not entirely independent. And this correlation can affect uh, model parameters and standard errors if you don't account for it. Um, so in meta-analysis, the published studies that you uh, obtain for, for your um, particular meta-analysis those are considered a random effect. It's one of many studies uh, published or, un, or not published um, that uh, uh, are <clears throat> uh, relevant to your particular uh, question. So um, in, ter in terms of doing the analysis, we're going to see that virtually everyone and everyone should do a random effects uh, analysis. So I want to uh, give you uh, a concrete example here of, <clears throat> of random and fixed effects. And then I'm also going to use the COURAGE trial to illustrate uh, some issues with um, a uh, meta-analysis that was done. So in the COURAGE trial, uh, we have coronary artery disease patients, uh, about 2,200 or more. Uh, nearly 2,300 total patients. And these came from three different healthcare systems, uh, Canadian hospitals, VA hospitals, and non-VA US hospitals. And so if we were to um, draw a diagram of, uh, of this, it would look something like this, where at the at top we have our three healthcare systems. Um, and then within each healthcare system, we have uh, the uh, uh, sites, the study sites that we are obtaining, uh, uh, we're going to use to get our patients from. And this within each site, uh, we have the patients and then um, each patient is either randomized to get PCI or optim optimal medical therapy, OMT. So, uh, and obviously each, healthcare system has more than two sites and each site has more than two patients. But um, our fixed effects in this case is treatment. So PCI versus uh, OMT or optimal medical therapy. And then our random effects are patients, patients within sites and then sites within the healthcare system. So there's actually two um, other than patients, uh, random effects that we could consider in 
in this analysis. Okay, so in doing uh, meta-analysis, there's a number of issues that we need to consider uh, that relate to the validity of a meta-analysis. Um, and the primary one is heterogeneity. In other words, is uh, the variability that we get in results, uh, what's causing that? Um, and then um, whether we're doing random or fixed effects, as I mentioned, most everybody does random effects analysis. And then uh, there might be influential studies, one or two studies that are uh, really affecting the, the results. This would be analogous to outliers um, or influential outliers in just regular um, uh, data analysis studies. And then we might uh, have a issue with order um, and I'll have, a, have an example where this might come into play. Um, and then uh, study bias. In other words, is there bias within each particular study that may affect uh, our results? So what we mean by heterogeneity and meta-analysis um, is the difference in the outcome that we're looking at um, whether it's like survival or uh, whatever the outcome might be, uh, the differences are the differences resulting from uh, the differences between individual studies, uh, which is not a, a good con um, outcome that we want to, um, to find. Um, what we hope to find is that their differences are between um, the uh, treatment groups, for example, is just due to random sampling variability of the studies. Um, and so, for example, um, say the direction of differences uh, in results might contribute to heterogeneity. So, for example, maybe we'll find some of the studies show a negative effect of the treatment, whereas other studies show a positive effect of the treatment. And so we're going to have to somehow sort that out um, and uh, we'll take a look at how, how we do that. So uh, different um, <clears throat> uh, terms that you might hear for bias and meta-analysis, um, one being selection bias, and that relates to the studies that you select. Um, and uh, it might uh, be publications because uh, there's a tendency for studies that find a significant effect to be published and studies that don't find a significant effect not to be published. Um, and then as we talked about heterogeneity, and then we might have issues in the particular studies related to data and measurement error. Uh, and you'd be surprised how often you come across that. <laughs> So the statistical methods themselves, as I mentioned, it's uh, pretty straight. Once we have our articles and our data abstracted in hand, then the statistics is fairly straightforward. So if we have a dichotomous outcome like um, survival or re, um, uh, uh, an outcome that's just yes or no, then we're gonna do logistic regression. And if we have a continuous outcome, then we're gonna do differences in means or, or rates. Uh, and the most common uh, method uh, that you see used in the literature is the Dersimian and Laird random effects method uh, for pooling the statistics. And then another statistic that uh, is very important, uh, in fact, that might be the first statistic you wanna look at in the results of a meta-analysis is the I-squared statistic. And that's going to tell us uh, how much heterogeneity is affecting uh, our results, uh, variation in the odds ratios or the mean difference. Then there's uh, several, or a couple anyway, uh, of uh, other um, um, methods that we will see uh, or likely to see in meta-analyses. And one is a what's called a funnel plot. I have an example of that, uh, that uh, uh, 
examines potential bias in the in the studies. Um, it's often uh, recalled in the literature um, publication bias, but uh, I think it it shows up more biases than just publication bias. But anyway, um, another uh, technique or method that you often see uh, is called the jackknife. And so we do an overall analysis uh, of the studies that we have in hand, and then we do a jackknife analysis, which means leave out one. So we take out one study, we redo the analysis, then we put that study back in and take out another one and redo the analysis. And so um, we uh, do that until we've exhausted all of the uh, studies that have been left out, and then we look at the analyses. And often what the jackknife will do is tell us if we've got one study that's really an outlier or that's really an influential study. And then meta-regression um, is um, analogous to multiple regression, where we're going to enter um, covariates in our um, meta-analysis that might affect the outcome besides the treatment or therapy that we're looking at. The problem with, with that that you run into is not all studies have the same covariates or looked at the same covariates in their studies. So that can present a problem in doing uh, meta-regression. So I want to um, look at a, a particular study and we'll look at these in some detail here. Uh, and this is the COURAGE study that um, uh, I mentioned uh, a, uh, a bit ago. Uh, and so this um, study was, was uh, published about 20 years ago. And the issue then was a controversy regarding the impact of PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, uh, versus medical therapy. Uh, in other words, an invasive versus a non-invasive um, treatment uh, on long-term survival in coronary artery disease patients. And what was found in the COURAGE trial uh, was that PCI, um, when uh, um, that, that by itself did not reduce the risk of death. Um, and then in this case, the risk of death we had, there was a, a um, kind of a multiple endpoint here of death or MI or death alone. So if you, the patient experienced any one of those, um, it was a yes. If they didn't experience any of them, then it was a no. Um, but uh, the Curtis trial then uh, concluded that there was no evidence. In other words, there was, um, a lack of statistical significance comparing PCI with uh, optimal medical therapy. However, after that study, um, then there was a meta-analysis um, that published 16 randomized trials and then also an abstract of PCI versus medical therapy. And uh, in this meta-analysis, uh, they concluded that there was a benefit of PCI for all-cause mortality. However, the cardiologists uh, involved in the study and, and uh, others were quick to point out that this meta-analysis uh, probably cherry-picked the studies that they included. Uh, and it selected studies that were a, a, a mix of chronic CAD patients and post-MI or uh, ACS patients. In other words, we had a mixture of uh, patient populations that were different. And then also the study omitted a major post-MI trial, the occluded artery trial. Uh, and so what we did then is to take um, the studies that were published in the uh, meta-analysis and we then also included uh, the OAT trial uh, in in uh, in a secondary in a second analysis. And so here's the, uh, what you typically see in a meta analysis: a forest plot with the different studies. Uh, sometimes you'll see your publication um, 
it listed as well. But basically what it is, uh, is, a, is a forest plot that has the, um, the uh, actual, in this case, odds ratio or mean difference if we had a continuous variable, um, the point estimate, and then the, uh, in this case, 95% confidence intervals that are indicated by the blue rectangles um, and the um, um, the the um, uh, data then that's actually included is is usually given over on the uh, right hand side where you have the in this case the two groups that you're comparing PCI versus medical therapy and uh, one uh, you can see that there's a uh, some small numbers uh, in these um, trials. I want to point out one here that has no events. And in calculating a uh, random effects model, these, um, or a fixed effects models, these actually have no bearing on, on the results if you have no, um, no outcomes in either group. But anyway, we see uh, the results here uh, they did both a random effects model and a fixed effects model. And so you can see the difference here. Um, we get the same point estimate that, in other words, uh, a um, estimate, an odds ratio of 0.8, which means that it's favoring um, PCI. And the confidence interval, though, is wider for the random effects model than it is for the fixed effects model. Uh, and so that's typical what you'll see is, is wider confidence intervals uh, for the random effects models. And then the other uh, statistic here that's uh, really important is the I squared. And there's a test you can do for statistical significance for the I squared. Uh, my recommendation is to ignore the statistical significant significance and look at the actual value. And so in this case, the I squared is 17%, which means that 17% 17, 17 of the variability uh, in uh, treatments between PCI and OMT is due to uh, study differences. Now there's, uh, of course, what is important to consider and not important to consider is kind of arbitrary, but what you'll typically see is that uh, less than 25% is considered neg negligible uh, impact, 25 to 50%, uh, 50% to 75%. And then if you have 75% or more of the very, of the, uh, on the I square statistic, then you pretty much gonna have to conclude that um, the results are due just to study differences and not, and you don't really know whether it's due to the treatment or not. Um, I like to use a little lower cutoff, but anyway, uh, in this case, the I squared for this particular meta-analysis is 17%. So um, what we did then is to do uh, another meta-analysis um, based on separating out the patient types. In other words, coronary artery disease versus post-MI patients and compared PCI versus medical therapy in each group separately. And so basically what we're doing is a random effects meta regression where <clears throat> our variable of interest is patient type. And then of course, we're going to calculate the I squared statistic to assess trial heterogeneity. And so what we found is that there was a treatment by patient type interaction uh, significant. And then uh, the meta-analysis, our estimate of the uh, odds ratios turned out to be different uh, between the groups. And so for the chronic CAD patients, the odd ratios was 0.9. And you can see that the confidence interval included one. So that was not statistically significant. But for the post-MI patients, the odds ratio was 0.5, and that was statistically significant, and that would that indicated a benefit 
of PCI over medical therapy. So we get different results for the two uh, for the two groups if we separate um, them out in the in the analysis. And so this is then our uh, replotting the um, the the forest plot with the two patient groups. And so you can see uh, the difference here that for the coronary artery uh, coronary artery disease, uh, the chronic CAD patients that the um, odds ratio is not statistically significant. And notice also that the I squared for these studies of the coronary disease patients is zero, which means that any that the differences that you see between those studies as far as the odds ratio goes is just due to random sampling. For the um, post-MI patients, however, uh, st or studies that uh, included just post-MI patients, we can see then that we get um, a uh, statistically significant odds ratios of, of 0.5, indicating uh, that uh, PCI uh, is better than uh, medical therapy in, in, presenting, or in preventing uh, death. So then uh, what we did is because there was a, a major trial, uh, the occluded artery trial that uh, was not included in the meta-analysis that was published. And so this was uh, actually patients um, that would be considered post-MI uh, patients and so should have been included in the analysis. And I've just given a... Um, kind of a summary here of what the study did, but basically their finding was that uh, their data did not support the use of PCI for um, persistent total occlusion or post-MI uh, patients. And so what we did then uh, is added uh, the OAT trial to the post-MI group and recalculated the um, odds ratio in the I squared. Of course, it's still the same for the chronic CAD patients, but you notice that now when we include uh, the occluded artery trial and post-MI that we get something of a different result. Uh, our odds ratio now is 0.63, which uh, in this case includes one. So that would not be considered statistically significant and then also look at uh, the I squared um, increases to um, getting close to 50%. So there's uh, indication that the results uh, for the post-MI studies is basically due to differences between the studies, uh, not necessarily between PCI and OMT. And this brings up, uh, I think, another important point about um, meta-analysis, uh, and that's been argued. And you can see that we have, um, there's two studies that are sort of, I guess you can consider the 900 pound gorillas in the study, and that's the COURAGE study, and then the OAT uh, trial. And you can see that there, both of those have a large number of patients, whereas all the others are pretty small uh, trials. And so the question that people have posed is one, um, you know, well thought out and well done and methodologically sound uh, large randomized trial better than uh, meta-analysis of a bunch of small trials. And uh, in this case, probably the answer to that is yes. Um, but obviously that's something that's argued um, even, even now, even to this day. So um, in either in however we do this, uh, whether we separate the um, uh, when we separate the pop patient populations and we include the out trial, then uh, there's really no evidence of a PCI benefit for chronic CAV patients or for post MI patients, and so we get 
um, some somewhat different results uh, from the um, what was concluded in the meta-analysis uh, when we uh, separate out different patient populations. Um, and then these are just, we've kind of already, I've already sort of mentioned um, this, the I squared and um, how that inc increased when we included the um, OAT trial. Um, and so the kind of the take home message is here when you either do a meta-analysis or are reading or using meta-analysis, you need to be careful uh, that there's not an inappropriate pooling of, of patient populations. Okay, the second one I wanna talk about is uh, um, uh, meta-analysis we did that looked at mortality in teaching versus non-teaching hospitals. And so um, uh, from um, uh, studies from January of, of 1987 to May of 2008, um, we had 32 search terms and came up with 32,000 uh, citations. So two reviewers um, then went through these, excluded uh, 822, uh, then another 582 uh, were further excluded. Uh, and down to 249 articles that had some indication of a teaching versus non-teaching comparison. However, not all of those actually gave you the data you needed. So what we ended up with was 100 studies uh, that compared mortality and teaching versus non-teaching hospitals. Now, the outcome, and this is sort of with a clue us right off the bat that we may have a problem here. The study outcome was mortality. However, mortality was uh, had different timelines in the studies. And so 61 of the studies looked at in-hospital mortality. Um, 35 looked at 30-day mortality post-hospitalization, and then four looked at greater than 30-day. Um, so right away we see that, okay, so it's our outcome is mortality, but uh, the fact that we have a difference in the time frames of mortality here could pose a problem. The studies also, um, we have a potential time problem in the fact that the studies span 21 years from 1987 to 2008. Um, so in this study, that may or may not have been a big deal. However, if you're looking at um, an outcome that's related to a, um, say, a surgical procedure or um, a medical procedure, then that span of years could pose a problem because obviously um, over a 20 year span, um, the um, uh, medical um, procedures and so on are going to change. Um, on the plus side, we, there are like, out of these 100 studies, there's like 26 million patients. So that's a lot of patients uh, to be included in the meta-analysis. So anyway, uh, what we found was that the random effects odds ratio um, favored <clears throat> the teaching uh, hospital. The odds ratio was 0.94 in the... Um, um, constant interval did not include one, although you can see that's pretty close to one. Um, so that's statistically significant. Nevertheless, it turns out that the I squared is virtually 100%, um, 99%. So that uh, tells us that virtually all of the difference between teaching and non-teaching hospitals is due to study heterogeneity, which is not particularly surprising, um, and especially given the sort of the difference in uh, when mortality occurred. And so uh, we did a funnel plot uh, for this, and this is what a funnel plot looks like. It plots the log of the odds ratios against the standard error of the log of the odds ratios. And so what you hope to see in a funnel plot is this smaller studies will be down here, be, at the bottom here because they will 
uh, have uh, wider cuff minerals, uh, more variability, whereas it, as the larger studies will be at the top of the funnel, but they will all be included in the 95% cuff zone. And so you can see that for this particular uh, meta-analysis that we have a lot of the studies that fall outside of the um, confidence intervals. And again, that is telling us that uh, we have um, a, uh, a real problem with uh, differences between studies um, being, in a sense, the cause of um, mortality in teaching versus non-teaching. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, before, that uh, we have an issue with the time of death that was not taken into account. Um, and then virtually all the between study variability is due to study differences. So in this case, it's pretty hard to draw a conclusion about uh, teaching versus non-teaching uh, or mortality and teaching versus non-teaching uh, hospitals. Okay, and then uh, um, a third one in the last uh, uh, example here that I want to uh, take a look at uh, is a more recent study, although it's still six years ago, I guess, um, from the European Heart Journal, and uh, a study that looked at uh, uh, long-term clinical outcomes in patients with angina, but without obstructive coronary artery, artery disease. And so um, in this particular study, the primary outcome was the composite pooled incidence of all-cause death and non-fatal MI. So if a patient had either one of those, they would have been coded as one having ex experiencing the outcome. If they had neither, then they would uh, be coded zero that they didn't experience the outcome. So I've included uh, um, just uh, some of the um, methods uh, that they have in their article. Um, and so um, I'm not going to take time to go through these in any particular detail. Um, so basically what they're computing here, the incidence uh, as the ratio between the number of events and the number of person years. And the reason that they're doing person years here is to account for heterogeneity of follow-up across the different studies. Um, as we'll see, this doesn't um, actually account for uh, all of the um, heterogeneity. So anyway, um, this is what they're uh, doing then. They use the random effects model um, and then they use, uh, of course, force plots with uh, point estimates, estimates, effect size, and 95% cuffs intervals. Um, and then what they did in this one that uh, wasn't done in the other two is they performed a jackknife um, sensitivity analysis. So as we mentioned, that's a leave out one, uh, redo the analysis. Um, and that gives you an indication of how robust your results are or whether there's a single study or maybe a couple studies that have uh, a real impact on the results. So here's their forest plot. You can see that they have quite a, a few articles. And you can also see that uh, they have something of an issue here of timelines. Um, in, in uh, the years that the study was done, or more likely this is the year the study was published that, you know, ranged from 1980 up to, I think there's 2014, 2015 studies in here. So we have a wide range of studies. Um, and uh, their basic conclusion here is the odds ratio or the, uh, not the odds ratio, but the incident rate is 0.99 which in the concern includes one, so there's no statistical significance. Um, and then also note that the I squared is really high, 96%. So this is saying that whatever um, differences we're finding here, uh, as far as our uh, incident rate is 
primarily due to differences in uh, the studies. So uh, again, what they found uh, is what they uh, uh, found is that the um, the outcome um, was not statistically significant. Uh, I think they there was a typo either in the in their narrative or in their um, forest plot. Um, they have the I squared listed as ninety one percent, whereas in the forest plot, it's um, more like ninety six percent. But nevertheless, that's a really high. And then they also looked at uh, in meta regression some uh, potential uh, clinical factors or risk factors that might have been associated with uh, the outcome. And uh, these turned out to be dyslipidemia, diabetes, and hypertension, which are um, all, which if you get one, you'd expect uh, the others as well, since they're all related. And so um, here's another kind of uh, plot that you might see in meta-analyses where they look at uh, covariates and their effect on the outcome. And so um, what you have here is basically the regressions of each uh, on um, the uh, number of events per person years. Uh, and the difference, the studies are indicated by the circles and the difference in size of the circles is related to the um, standard error or uh, the precision. In other words, basically the sample size. So the uh, smaller the circle, the better the estimates or the better the precision, the larger the circle, probably the smaller the studies and the less precision. So um, one thing that... Uh, that I thought that might be interesting to do uh, for this particular study, since there were so many of them, um, and I've never seen this actually done, so, uh, and it would be quite time consuming as well. But anyway, an interesting way to look at this might be, instead of just ordering the studies in the forest plot, and you saw, uh, if you remember, they um, arranged them alphabetically uh, by author. Uh, but if instead, if we order the studies from the lowest to the highest effect, maybe we can identify sets of studies where we have a small I squared, and I chose less than 10%, uh, which would indicate that whatever differences there were was just random sampling error. And then we'll recalculate the pooled effect size and confidence intervals. And so this is uh, what their plot would look like when it's arranged by uh, the effect size from the smallest. Uh, and you can see that there's a number that are less than one and then a number that are greater than one. Um, and so then what I did is to look for groups of um, studies where the I squared was small. And so this is what I came up with um, where there's like four or maybe three, because there's only three studies in the last group there. But, um, and, and you can see that uh, for the first group there, uh, and as well as the second group, uh, the I squared is actually zero. So the, these, this means that differences are um, in, uh, really just due to random sampling variability. So, what we might do then, uh, and also you notice that the um, confidence intervals uh, are quite different between the groups. Uh, in fact, they're pretty much non-over, some are entirely non-overlapping. And the uh, um, incident per, uh, in this case, they're doing 100 person years, uh, are also quite different in the groups of studies. And so the question would be, what is it about these studies that group together that, uh, is there some commonality? Is there something about them uh, that would give us a better estimate or why would it be giving us a different estimate than putting all of them uh, together, uh, analyzing all as all together? So uh, their, their conclusions here are pretty, seem to be 
pr pretty um, good in the sense that they don't um, try to, um, uh, I guess, overinterpret or or underinterpret uh, the results because um, they um, say that they have quite a you know quite heterogeneous. And then they also mention that there's inconsistency, inconsistent definitions among the study. Um, and so um, this also would, would be a potential problem of why there's su such great um, variability, why the I squared is so, so high. Um, and so, um, and, and they do mention that the outcomes appear to be extremely variable. Uh, and we saw that when we arranged them by by the effect size. Um, and and then they mentioned that it's worse in those with cardiovascular risk factors, um, arthrosclerosis, um, um, which was related to diabetes and dyslipidemia and hypertension. Um, so their their conclusions, I think, are, are I guess I would say I would call them their honest conclusions. Um, and um, the uh, one issue that they don't address, uh, which may or may not have um, been pertinent, was um, the wide range of years that the studies were uh, were published. So. Um, <clears throat> This is what we've, um, uh, what I've already talked about as far as the study is concerned. And so uh, in terms of arranging them by um, studies that have a small um, I squared or a small uh, variability, is there some sort of demographic or clinical variable that might identify these groups or why would they um, you know, group that way. Now that would be, uh, I say, I've never seen this done, although I don't think it would be an interesting exercise, but probably by the time they've done their um, um, literature search and sorted through all of them and done the analysis, they probably nobody wants to go back and <laughs> look at that, uh, look at the articles in that much detail. But I think it would be an interesting um, exercise. Okay, so um, basically uh, we're gonna look at, at uh, meta-analysis, not as the pinnacle of uh, information quality, but uh, for what it is, uh, basically it's, it's a tool for combining results of several studies. Um, and it, um, the results, and especially results that are presented, presented may or may not be uh, worth the, um, um, I guess, worth the exercise because um, it it, um, it requires a, uh, a good deal of methodological rigor and in careful inclusion of homogeneous trials um, and the avoidance of selective exclusion. And this is one of the major complaints about um, meta-analysis and why many uh, investigators are sort of reluctant to put much stock in them because you can easily cherry pick the uh, studies uh, to include in the meta-analysis that show what you personally think it should show. Um, so that's sort of one of the, one of the drawbacks of, of meta-analysis. Uh, and then also a common definition of outcomes is, is really important to consider and whether they're defining the outcomes in the same way. And as we saw in the teaching versus non-teaching hospital, we had the same outcome as far as mortality, but there was different times frame for it. Uh, and then obviously when you do a meta-analysis, you want to treat uh, the, um, or, or do a random effects analysis. If the I squared is actually zero, then the random effects and fixed effects come out to be the same. So um, 
but it's when you have an I squared that's greater than zero, then you want to do a random effects uh, analysis. So I want to uh, end up with um, talking about uh, evaluating meta-analyses. Um, and so uh, some of these we've gone over before, so I won't reiterate them. Um, but my bottom line here um, is be very skeptical when you read a meta-analysis or if you're going to do a meta-analysis or you're going to use an a meta-analysis. And probably one of the most useful things of meta-analysis is that uh, you can get some idea of an effect size to use in um, designing a new study that uh, looks at the same outcomes and the same treatments um, and use that as a basis for, you know, how many patients you're going to need. Um, and then um, uh, finally, um, in more recent meta-analyses, you'll see uh, an assessment of study validity. And uh, you can get on the internet, uh, find dozens of these of uh, assessing study, study validity. But in doing a meta-analysis anymore, you're probably going to need to, um, uh, to include that in as, as well as just the presentation of the results of the meta-analysis. So I, I have an example here. Like I say, you can find these on the internet. Um, also, you can find uh, a plethora of um, software to do meta-analyses on the internet that are free. Uh, the major um, statistical packages like SAS and Stata, um, I think SPSS uh, will do a meta-analysis. Uh, but if you don't want to pay for those, then you can find um, free ones on, on, on the internet. So what I want to do is end up here with showing you an example of a um, uh, meta-analysis evaluation. And so this comes from the NHLBI, uh, but like I say, you can find others, you can find a lot uh, just going out on the internet of um, different forms and different questions to use in evaluating uh, meta-analysis. And you'll usually have a set of criteria here for this one from the NHLBI, there's eight criteria. Um, starting out with, is it on a focus question? That is, do you actually have a hypothesis that you can test? Um, and then the eligibility criteria for each study, uh, the literature search strategy, um, and then uh, the quality of each included study um, that's as rated by at least two reviewers. Um, and um, then the, the last two, seven and eight, are probably more important was publication bias assessed and was heterogeneity assessed. Um, and so then uh, you, they have however many raters you have, like I say, at least two, give them a rating, and uh, this will give you uh, an idea of how good the meta-analysis is as far as uh, interpreting and using the results. And then so for each criteria they have, uh, and I've included it here on the slides, because uh, I own uh, Georgetown will make the slides available to those who have rest, um, registered for the seminar. So that would be, if, if you're doing the meta-analysis, you may find them helpful. Um, so that's, and then for each of the uh, questions or each of the criteria, they give a little bit of a narrative here on what they mean by that and, and uh, how to do it. And so I'm not gonna go through these in any, any great detail, but, uh, uh, quite a bit on the literature search, um, on um, studies to include and exclude um, internal validity of the studies, uh, and then publication bias, and then heterogeneity. They have a, quite a bit to say about that because that's a really important um, aspect 
of meta-analysis that has to be considered. And so I have a few references here. Uh, the last two, even though they're 20-some uh, years old, are probably the, um, um, I guess you'd say, the, the standard for doing meta-analysis and, and uh, quantifying heterogeneity and, and looking at uh, uh, that in, in meta-analyses, where Higgins is the first author of both of those. So um, I want to thank you for your time and, and uh, attention here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if you'd like to use the question and answer, we have a few minutes here. If you want to um, use the question and answer box, you can. Or if you just want to uh, email me at my MedStar address here, I'd be happy to uh, respond to those. Otherwise, um, as I mentioned, uh, I send the, the slides will be uh, made available to those who are registered, uh, and they'll send the uh, uh, Georgetown will send those out. So I want to again thank you, and uh, we will uh, do uh, this again uh, next month. Uh, I believe it's February sixteenth. Uh, will be our next uh, seminar. So again, thank you. And have a good good day.